had a lot of people that they're better than everybody else if they receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Well, I'm a whole lot holier person than her, and she hasn't. If you look at it that way, that's an arrogance that's not going to serve you well. I can promise you that. Because let's look at these two people right here. Let's say that they are, well, mother-daughter. Here they are. And great Aunt Viola died. And great Aunt Viola loved them both. So what did she do? She left each of them a million dollars in the bank. Each of them gets a million. Well, she gets the letter in the mail that says, Amy, great Aunt Viola left you a million dollars in the bank. And she reads that letter and says, for me, that gift is for me. I'm going to run Lombano, that, that million dollars in the bank, so I can spend it and so I can do wonderful things to bless people with that money. Well, poor Sophia, she, she doesn't get that letter somehow that it got, it got lost. Dead, the dead mails are a file somewhere with lost mail somewhere in Atlanta, Georgia, they say. So she didn't get that letter. She doesn't realize that that's million dollars laid up for her in the bank. Does that make her any better than her? Any holier than her? No. All it means is she found out about it and she didn't. Mm -hmm. she, but the same gift, that same million dollars is in the bank for both of them. But nobody told her. Do you see why I'm preaching this? Because we have to tell the world what's laid up for them of the Father. This gift of the Holy Ghost is laid up for everybody. It's a free gift. A free gift. Now, the church world, where I have told you there's the divide, where they think they're holier if they receive that, false, false, false. Another falsity here, when you're talking about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, a lot of the church world thinks, well, you don't have anything if you don't have that. False. If you say, well, you know, she's never been baptized in the Holy Ghost, and I have, she's got nothing. That's not true. You better really watch how you, y'all aren't doing this. I'm talking in general. You better really watch how you judge somebody else as to say they don't have anything. I spent years and years trying to, golly, how did we say it? Pray people through to the Holy Ghost. I'm putting in quotation marks. We're going to pray them through to the Holy Ghost. Okay, I hate to keep picking on you, but you're on the front row. <laughs> now, next time you know, you'll sit in the back. But here we are, and uh, she wants to receive the Holy Ghost. So she comes to the altar, and man, I pray. I'm trying to pray her through the Holy Ghost. My preacher used to make me laugh out in Winston because he'd say, you know, he when he was praying for the Holy Ghost, people would be like, you know, I'll do it to me. You know, slamming him on the back saying, hold on, brother, just hold on. And then somebody would be on the other side slapping him going, just let go, brother, just let go. He's thinking, do I hold on, do I let go? I don't know, you know what, what do I do, what do I do? And I, I've seen it that way. They just about leave the altar where they can't hardly walk because people have been beating on them and yelling in their ear, come on, sister, just praise him. We're approaching it the wrong way. What a lot of the church world is doing is assuming that somebody who's never been baptized in the Holy Ghost has nothing. And they got to somehow get it. they got to somehow get it. And the person who's praying for, here's poor Sophia, and we're clapping her on the back and saying, hang on, let go, and she doesn't know what to do. And here she's sitting here praying, and she goes home that night, and she's thinking, still don't have it. Have it. Maybe Wednesday night they'll have an altar service and I'll pray again. Maybe I'll get it then. So she goes back Wednesday night and she can't. Nothing happens. She goes home again and she's got this mindset. I still don't have it. I knew a man when I began to go tarry, as they call it, for the Holy Ghost baptism. I was 19. There was a man about 60 who had been tarrying for the Holy Ghost for months, maybe years. And when I received a few months later, he was still tarrying. When I left that church years later, he was still tarrying. It had never happened for him. But guess what? They were teaching him that he didn't have anything. And he was, you know, starting to feel defeated. You've got to approach it a different way and say, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have said I want to follow him. I am his. I have repented of my sins and I've made that turn. I've experienced, you know, that repentance. I've gone down in the water in his name and I've risen in new life. And now I know that that seed of the Spirit is right here. And now I want it to just fully baptize me. Since I began to approach it that way, 
to quit saying that somebody who's never spoken in tongues has nothing. When I decided to quit approaching it that way, all of a sudden there was no tarrying anymore. There, there was no tarrying. Nobody had to come back for months and years to the altar and keep feeling like, well, maybe tonight's my night. Let me put my hands up and pray one more time. That ended. From that point on, everybody who wanted to receive that I talked to, and they wanted to receive, we just laid hands on them. You don't even have to lay hands on them, but, you know, that, that's a nice way to do it, too. We laid hands on them, and because they believed that the seed of the Spirit was already in them, mm -hmm. oh, it just fully baptized them, and there it was. There he was. Mm -hmm. So we've got to be careful not to dwell in the arrogance of thinking that people who've never spoken in tongues have nothing. Acts chapter 8. We'll, we'll skip Acts 4.31. I've already told you about that one. Acts 8, 14 through 17. Now when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God. Look at that received. It's highlighted. That's dekomai. That's that um, passive. They had received the word of God. Somebody had taken the word of God to them. And there they go. They received that word of God. Okay, That's already done. In Samaria, they received that word of God. But when they heard that, the apostles at Jerusalem, what they do? They sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Two different words. That receive is lombano. Oh, my goodness. You've got one scripture right there with, with the word receive in English that looks the same to us, but it's two totally different things in Greek. They had passively <coughs> received the word of God, but they had not lombano received the Holy Ghost. But they'd already believed. They'd already received the word of God. That tells you there's another step in this process that all Christians can have. Let's keep going who when they were come down prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. These people were already baptized in the name of Jesus, but they had not yet received the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received, lombano, the Holy Ghost. Now, there's an interesting thing here with the word fallen upon them. You know, I always, I've been studying this. My daughter Megan and I were talking about this on the phone last night. When you think fallen upon, you think that there's something that, you know, just falls down from heaven upon you. It falls upon you. It, it can mean that. But this fallen upon in Greek can also mean, oh, I did, I put it on the paper. How about that? I added this last night. Fallen. It comes from the Greek word. It is the Greek word. Epipipto which can mean to fall, to rush, to press upon, but more than that, it means to take possession of. When you're talking about the Holy Ghost falling on someone, you, it's not necessarily that something just descends. It can, but what it means is it takes possession of you. That seed of God that's been planted on you, in you suddenly just takes full possession of you. So these people received the Holy Ghost, baptism, by the laying on of hands. Now, it doesn't always have to be that way, as we're going to see in the next scripture. Look at Acts chapter 10. Still on page 3 near the bottom, 44 through 47. Now, here's Peter. He's gone to preach to a bunch of Gentiles. Most of y'all know this story already. But here's an example where nobody had to go lay hands on them. Nobody even had to explain to them what this Holy Ghost was all about. All he's doing is preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. So Peter's down there preaching to the Gentiles, which was a strange thing for a Jew to do, but God told him to do it. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. And they of the circumcision, that means the Jews, they of the circumcision which believed were astonished, as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God, then answered Peter, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized which have received lambano, the Holy Ghost, as well as we? And they were astounded. Nobody was going through the crowd laying hands on them and slapping them on the back and hang on and turn loose. Nobody was doing any of that. They're just preaching the word. And all of a sudden, out in the audience, 
the Gentiles began to just speak in other tongues and magnify God. And Peter and the Jews were flabbergasted. They received the Holy Ghost the way we did. Well, how can we forbid water? If they want to be baptized, we need to baptize them because it's happened to them like it did us. This gift is for everybody. Uh, there's another divisive teaching in churches. Let's just get it all out there so we can get these questions answered. There's another divisive teaching that says it's only for some people. It's just for some. It's not for everybody. It, now, now, don't get confused with the gift of tongues. It's a whole different thing. The gift of tongues as to be used in a church service to bring an edification to the body, that's different from the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I have a second teaching on that. We won't have time to get to that tonight, but I feel like this is something I need to teach very soon. We're talking about the gift of the Holy Ghost that Peter told us in Acts chapter 2 is for everybody. I've been in uh, church settings where I've heard people say it's just for a select few who maybe need to go further and are going to be in ministry. It's just for them. And so for those holier people, it's okay. Let's, they'll follow on through. It's for everybody. It's not this, this gift of sanctification that when you get holy enough, you can move to that realm. I have seen also churches try to clean everybody up, try to say, well, you're not yeah. going to receive that holy ghost. And did I hear an yeah. amen? Who said that? Thank you. You know, Let's try to clean her up. Look at that, wearing pants in church. Can you believe that? Yeah. Let's try, yeah, me too. So let's try to clean her up. Maybe if she starts wearing dresses to church, God will see to fill her with the Holy Ghost. He'll see that she's sanctified now. No! No, 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 no. The Holy Ghost is for anybody who has believed in Jesus Christ and, and they've turned their lives around and follow Him. It's for everybody. Quit trying to clean people up. Not that I think wearing pants is wrong, obviously, in church. But quit trying to clean everybody up thinking that then he'll move for them once you clean them up. You go ahead and let that person start moving in God and you see what the Holy Ghost will do for them. I, I knew a preacher who told me of a man. I didn't know this man that he talked about. He said that he won a cocaine addict to the Lord years ago. And he said that that cocaine addict started getting really depressed, really down, and he finally confided in him. He said, I've got to tell you what I've been doing. He said, at night, I get that Bible. Who, who Lombano'd that Bible? There it is. She Lombano'd it. He said, I'm going to confess to you that at night, when I'm reading my Bible, I'm putting lines of cocaine on the Bible. And I'm snorting cocaine right off the pages of the Bible. Yeah, I know. Wow. But here's what that preacher told him. I hope I'd have been this wise. That preacher said, I'm not going to tell you what you're doing is right, because it's not. He said, but don't you quit reading your Bible. He said, don't, right now, let's don't focus on the fact that you're snorting cocaine off, off the pages of your Bible. You just keep reading that Bible, and you keep seeking Jesus for all you're worth. And I promise you, there's going to come a day real soon you won't be snorting cocaine off the pages of your Bible. Do you know that happened for that man because that preacher had wisdom and said, let's, let's get yeah. you with God right where you are, not try to clean you up first and say, well, then you can read your Bible once you quit snorting that cocaine. No. He said, you seek Jesus and this stuff's going to eventually fall away from you as you fall in love with Him. That's what the Holy Ghost will do.